Give it up for Mickey Drexler. Uh, this is a, a very special conversation uh, for me. I have uh, had, had the pleasure and now privilege to know you now for quite some time. Yeah, a long time. And um, I have wanted to, ha to sit with you to talk about the state of retail, um, your life, and perhaps some lessons in where all of this is headed, uh, given your history uh, at The Gap, creating Old Navy, resuscitating and created really I mean, it wasn't really a recession. You created you Banana Republic. I mean, was it? Was it? Was no, it, no. Was we it, had just purchased that. Was it? Was, but it was a turnaround. Yeah. Effectively. Yeah. Um, and then what you did with J. Crew and Madewell, uh, all remarkable things. However, I want to start with the tough stuff. Okay. As you may all know, uh, Mickey, uh, according to this headline, it says J. Crew CEO Mixie, Mickey Drexler fires himself. Where'd you see that? This, this came out, I'm looking uh, right around when you uh, fired yourself. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. It says, okay. we'll remain board chair. What's it like to fire yourself? Well, it's... Is it's, that what happened? It's not 100% accurate, but being in the retail business for the last... Uh, well, I've run companies for 37 years, and the last two or three years have not been fun whatsoever. And uh, I was a... Uh, I, I didn't kind of fire myself, but I kind of stepped down and became chairman, uh, the board and I agreed that I wanted to go and they were fine with it as long as I hung around for a while. Uh, so I kind of was over the last year or two planning to fire myself. So it finally happened July 10th of this year. And uh, I, didn't, I don't know if I fired myself, but it's okay. Um, Not the first time I've been fired, so. So you were fired? No, I wasn't fired. I'm, I'm, I'm actually the largest shareholder, individual, that doesn't say much, at J. Crew, because my partners, TPG and Leonard Green, own about 90, and I own 10% of the company. So help us understand, you just said the last couple of years have not been fun. They have not been fun. It has not been fun for virtually all of the people in the quote-unquote traditional retail business. Uh, for sure. It's been miserable. I mean, I don't want to see that as a headline, but... It's not you might fun. have just made it. Yeah, just, uh, <laughs> I better watch what I say because I realize there's so much press here. But anyway, it hasn't been fun. And it hasn't been fun because what? Meaning, when did you realize that something was turning? Well, you know, there's always signals uh, and uh, always ability to connect dots. But over the last two years or so, no matter what, what you did, it seemed to be falling more so behind than moving ahead. You realized when, uh, when there was this uh, uh, huge growth in uh, sale, uh, and you know, and this device here in my pocket actually is every brand in the world. I could shop right now any brand, check the prices, uh, buy it at the cheapest price, so, uh, so there's no protection on price. And uh, you realize when the traffic in the, in the malls and in stores were dropping, you realize when uh, there was not that much differentiation in product. Uh, but mostly every day you looked at the numbers uh, and they reinforced that in most cases. Uh, for example, Madewell, which uh, is now a 10-year-old company, is an extraordinarily fast growth business. Smaller, not really a legacy brand, uh, uh, very much focused on making the best genes in the world we try to think we do. And so that, uh, that business has been growing, but it's also not, as I call it, a legacy business that's been around the, that long a time. And it's guaranteed in the fashion business, this is the only time where I've seen it, that usually fashion brands or anything that's fashion-y kind of has this life term, and then it kind of gets hit, hit, hit a wall, and then it usually comes back. The, the difference now is it's not coming back that, that easily anymore or it's not coming back. And you think that's a function of technology? And, and, and by the way, I'm pointing at your pocket because you had your iPhone there. You used to be on the board of Apple. Yes. When Steve Jobs was running the company. Right. And Loreen Powell Jobs is going to be joining us very soon. Oh, good. Um, did you guys ever talk about the coming age of this happening? Well, I, don't, I think you know, it took the, the speed of it. Yeah, we talked about it for sure, but, uh, and everything was moving in this direction. But I don't think anyone was prepared 
or I wasn't prepared for the speed in which it's happened. Uh, although in a funny sense, if I look back at my career, and I know we don't have that much time, but 30 years ago when I uh, started running Ann Taylor, I recognized I got out of the department store business because there was no protection of your inventory against price. And then you had to drive 30 or 40 miles to the nearest discounter. Uh, there was not this device that gave you every price worldwide and you can spend it. And there was no Amazon, of course. Uh, so for me, uh, I moved out of the business of being a branded buyer because I didn't want to depend upon someone else's brand. Steve, when, when we joined together, he, he went on the gap board, I went on his board, knew that he couldn't, if he couldn't control his brand and the environment, he would not have a future Apple business. So then he went into the retail business owned his distribution. Now, of course, he sells others but, but himself. But I think, uh, uh, I think we all kind of knew it was coming, just the speed of it. How much, though, is this about technology disrupting the business? And how much is it about the change in behavior of consumers, which is to say what we wear matters, how we appear matters, or have mattered, I should say. And maybe, perhaps, people are more willing to take their dollars and buy the phone. Well, I, I couldn't agree more with what you just said, the latter, how much has to do with consumer change of their behavior. You can't just blame technology because technology is part of retail. Uh, you know, retail today is seamless between online and bricks and mortar. The fact is, one cannot argue with a customer and his or her tastes and trends. So in my personal opinion, and this is all my personal opinion, there's a trend going on which says clothes are just not that important or as important as they were. And if you go through the audience, and I always do this at the office when I went to the office every day is how old is what you're wearing and what's the latest trend in the world and what's this, that, and the other thing. So uh, I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that it's less important. It has to do with the fact that everyone's, I don't want to keep reaching into my pocket here, but everyone's kind of obsessed with spending time on this. Uh, they're not really hanging around in the, I used to call shopping centers the local villages, but you don't have to go to the village to see other people uh, if, uh, if, if you're on your device, because that's the new way of meeting and seeing and having relationships. The hot thing over the last several years was this idea of fast fashion, the Zaras of the world. And people said that's what was really taking market share. Is that still the issue, or is it really that the, just the dollars are, are not even going, you said about new clothes, to, to even that kind of material? Well, uh, you know, again, in my opinion, at the end of the day, is more inventory, and I think in economics, and I wasn't a great economics student, but I think the more inventory, uh, even if demand stays the same, it pushes down prices. So I think there's been deflation in the industry. Um, I think the uh, fact that if I'm a customer and I'm used to seeing 30 off today, 40 off tomorrow, Black Friday is coming and they'll be giving away inventory, I think the fact of the matter is that, um, that people get used to not spending full price and, uh, and the fact is that uh, you don't have to. It's changed everything. Fast fashion has had huge growth. And you really can't feel goods online. I mean, and, and the fast fashion players have been fantastic. They weren't around in, in 10 or 15 years ago. And I think it's okay to buy clothes, wear them for a night. Someone said to me yesterday that, well, I'm renting clothes by the month. And why should I even buy clothes anymore? So I, I think clothes don't play the same role in one's life as they used to. Okay, so your former employer, Ann Taylor. Yes. Is now renting their clothes. Oh, they are, uh, that's right, they are, and I was talking about Rent the Runway. What do you think, I mean, do you th talk about, what do I uh, think talk about, about we, we did ride sharing this morning with Uber. Is there a day where we're all gonna be renting clothes? <laughs> well, you know, uh, I, what do I think? I, I think it's pay attention to your core business, get your goods looking great, try to figure out how not to be a discounter, and don't start groping for solutions to problems that aren't that easy to solve. I mean, you have to sometimes face the reality that something is not going to grow, and it might be going like this. And maybe that's the state of the retail business. Okay, but let me ask you just a sort of, maybe this is a life question for you. You look at the gap and this remarkable success you had. Grow, 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 it's great. And then it starts to level off and then it starts to politely, I'm gonna say, go down a little bit. Absolutely. Same with J. Crew, right? You get there, it's hot, 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 hot. You inject this energy into it. Is that the life cycle of fashion? Is that 
something else? Is there any way that you think, when you go look back at your experiences, that you could have kept it going forever? Uh, I, I kind of think it's the life cycle of life. It's great, it's amazing, it's exciting, and then it kind of wears off a little. And then, at, it's a very low entry. The copycats come in. We started Old Navy because uh, uh, Target announced they were copying a cheap version of Gap. This is in 1994, so I went to Target looking at their cheap version of Gap. They were called uh, Dayton Hudson then, and it was called Everyday Hero. So I looked at the, their knockoff for the Gap store, and I got furious and angry, because that's what you do when a competitor is trying to take, you know, eat your lunch. And then we stopped off in Chicago on the way back to San Francisco and found out that Gap's clothes, and I learned this, was not the cheapest game in town. And I always thought Gap, coming from Ann Taylor, was less cheap. Anyway, long story short, we gave a bunch of people 200 bucks each uh, to go shop discounters. These are people who worked at Gap. And they came back and said, as long as the clothes are right, the value's there, uh, and, and they didn't say this, but treated respectfully, with dignity, uh, we think uh, we sure would buy cheaper clothes. Then we found out Gap's jeans started at $35, 80% of the jeans in America in 1994 were uh, under $30, so we started Old Navy, named after a bar on Rue Saint-Germain in Paris. Now, that's part of the art and science of retail. So we went into the Old Navy business, which is still doing well, different version of it than we, fa than, that we founded, but I think fashion brands do run their course, and then they get reinvented. A, a, a fancy, expensive example is Gucci right now. Uh, and, and I don't... I'm not a fashion expert. I'm a, I'm a business person who likes to sell merchandise. And I don't think it's about fashion as much as product and what people are wearing and figuring out the tastes and lifestyle of people. But I think you said it. I don't think clothes are that important anymore. Okay, but let me, let me go then back to the digital side and talk about what I think in, in retail is the elephant in the room and, and, and read you this. This is Lee Peterson. He's the EVP of Brand Strategy and Design at WD Partners. He says that Jeff Bezos is the greatest merchant of this century, and he says, who is going to be the next successor of brilliance? None of these merchant princes have successors. Who is Ralph Lauren's successor? It's not Tom Ford, it's no one. And that that is what Jeff Bezos has done. What do you think about that, and what do you think about what Amazon is doing? Uh, I think it's been nothing short of extraordinary, uh, but of course, if you look at their earnings, and, and, and I, I'm not a stock market person, I don't understand the earnings thing, but they announced earnings with Facebook and Google in the last two weeks, and you looked at the 190 some odd million versus the billions and whatever, one on $33 billion in sales. I guess if you go out there, you, uh, if, if you're valued at the extraordinary level you're valued at, and, and, and people say, well, you don't really have to have any margins, Look, uh, forgetting that everyone's angry with them half the time or that they do what they do, but they've been nothing short of brilliant. They've created a new habit of shopping in the world. It's a habit. And once people change their habits, you know, it's really hard to undo that. Okay, but here's then a brand question. Would you sell your goods on Amazon? That, that is the central question that so uh, many companies well, are grappling with today. Well, I don't have to make that decision today because I am not the CEO anymore. I would not sell my goods on Amazon. Because? Because, uh, number one, they own the customer. Number two, I'd be afraid that they would take every bestseller and put it into their private label collection, which I think they would do. Now, I have enormous respect for, for Amazon, and they're extraordinary competitors, but I would not do it. Now, and, and how do you think about the trickle-down effect, not just to, to traditional retail, but I'm starting to think of companies even like Nike or Under Armour that have taken such a hit, even though those were not considered fashion brands before? Well, I, I think they're, first of all, they're legacy brands. I guess I'm not, I don't follow Nike that closely. I know Under Armour's taken a huge hit, but maybe some of that's due to their acquisitions. Maybe some of it's due to the shoe business. I think it's a great brand, and I, I bet it will come back with Kevin making it come back. And Nike is, it's an iconic brand. It's going to be around. Now, I'm on the board of a tiny little company. I hope everyone will shop there. It's called Outdoor Voices. It probably does, the whole company does maybe what one quarter of a Nike store does. But I'm having fun as the chairman and an investor. 
And you know, the, the exciting thing about the business, and nothing stops you, is that you can take something, move it forward. If you have the right goods, you have the right delivery, you have the right passion, you have the right leadership, and you're doing something that's differentiated from the competitors. So, uh, so I, think, I think those two brands are here to stay in a really important way. Uh, what is going, I mean, Outdoor Voices is a, is a fascinating new sort of up and comer in the same way that All Birds. Uh, well, all Birds, woo. So, but speak to that though. There, there, there are these sort of micro brands that are becoming much larger brands. So it's not to say that everybody is dying. It, it's to say that certain legacy companies. I, 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 th I think the legacy companies, first of all, if you do something exciting, look at Glossier. I mean, I spent the day, two days there last week. I mean, it was extraordinary. I don't know if they make any money. And by the way, a lot of these brands, Glossier aside, I mean, let's see when and how they become profitable. Because, you know, I'm now, I have this tiny little venture thing, meaning I follow around my big brother venture capitalists and they, I'll put in five, I'll put in 10, but they lost $15 million this year. It doesn't matter, I'm gonna spend all this money, it's free. Uh, and everyone's chasing these deals like it's the hottest thing in the world. Long term, and it's long term, we'll see who wins and see who loses. I think it's exciting. Look at um, Supreme. Didn't, didn't uh, BlackRock buy them for, was it a billion or $500 million? A lot of money. I mean, it's a, you line up, it's a sneaker store, a small sneaker store. It's, God bless them that they could do that, you know. But, so what, but, what, but, but <laughs> then the question is, is there a market in building and, and creating brands that can effectively be sold to somebody else? And I'll give you an example. Walmart bought uh, Bonobos. Yeah. What do you think of that? Do I have to say it publicly? Well, we're, we're, we're here. You can, you can whisper it to me I mean, I realize there's like. a few headlines here. What do I think of it? I don't understand it. But we'll see what happens. I don't understand it. You don't know which part? That they bought... Uh, they should have bought J. Crew instead. <laughs> Would have you, that's, and that's a serious question. Would have, when you were running the company, or even today as the chairman, if Jeff Bezos called you up and said, look. Oh, I, I, I think he should have. He, sh he should have called you. Well, we. He still could. We called, well, he should have, because he would have purchased, he would have acquired a, a, a machine of style and taste and fashion. Uh, his, what is it, 26 billion of apparel sales, whatever the number is, versus us. So we, we're a rounding error on his daily stock trades. Uh, he buy talent, and it's talent. We, we are, we're content in a sense. We have this extraordinary design team, marketing team and all that. And uh, that was not the first it was thought of. I, to me, we went to visit some of his team members on that. It, it, to me, it would have been an extraordinarily smart thing to do. Well, you, you went to him. Well, sometimes you don't go to Jeff directly. But you went to them. Yeah, with the thought of that they should be interested in acquiring us. And hasn't happened. Well, there's no breaking news here. <laughs> so <laughs> It's fascinating to me that you went to him. Um, well, I, I, like I say, we went through, he, he didn't meet with us. I met Jeff years ago, but, uh, but it, I thought it was, the, by the way, I thought Walmart should have done it too. I thought Target should have done it. The thing that these big companies need is creativity to, to see where the puck is going and to drive forward. And it's still about the product. I, I, you know, I spoke to Eddie Lampert years ago about Sears being one of the great uh, uh, opportunities, one of the great potential brand sellers in America. Jeans and t-shirts, the, the Sears archives, extraordinary. So, you know, this is not the normal kind of business. It's an art and a science business. And the art and the science come together and then it becomes the business. But uh, I think that uh, there are companies that could have, well, Walmart was the same thing. You know, you, you kind of throw something out there and say, is there any interest? Um, but uh, look, my if I were, doing another business, it would still be really cheap, cool clothes, the American uniform, and done with great color style. I have, a, I have a, an, an act that I do. It's color, it's key items, it's style, and good value with great marketing. 
and, and an emotional connection to the consumer. That's needed in, in this industry so today. Are you gonna make new, are you gonna go do that? At this point in my life, you know, I, maybe. Maybe, <laughs> maybe. I don't know. <laughs> um, you mentioned um, potentially trying to, at some point, sell the company. There were reports years ago uh, that you were very close to a transaction with Uniqlo. Very close with Uniqlo, but uh, we got a little greedy. Uh, he offered what was uh, a fair price, and we turned it down. And then there was a leak. Uh, I think it was in the Wall Street Journal. I, I think they found out who leaked the news, and he was really upset about it. And that was the end of the relationship. In fact, I, I never heard from him again. Do we you, were good friends. You know, I'm you, hurt. Do you, do you regret not selling the company? In hindsight, look, at the end of the day, uh, I worked for uh, PE firms. And I was a, I'm a 10% owner. Of course, look, do I regret it? In life, no. In, in business, in measurement, yes. We could have sold it at a premium price. And that was just about at the point where things started to tip. And you did mention private equity. When you look at the success or failure of some of these companies, a lot of private equity money has been rushing in uh, to retail. There's always the question of, A, are you growing too fast or trying to grow for growing sake, and B, the debt that goes on these companies. Does it make sense? Uh, when you lose, it makes absolutely no sense. Where does this all go? <laughs> Where does this all go from here? Well, I think I had uh, lunch with some good private equity friends yesterday, and they're so afraid of retail today, almost to the point where, uh, you know, they're uh, overreactive. Uh, where does it go? I, I have no idea where it goes. I think there will be some great value there, but it's not like the old days in retail, where, yes, it's selling at a three or four multiple of its EBITDA, and is it going to come back? And you can look at companies there, but then you have to figure out if there's a vision uh, because you're not going to win on, on the lowest prices. You're going to win on differentiating product at great pricing. And uh, I looked at a company for my little fund, and I say fund, it's little, uh, with other people. It's a great prestigious brand, and uh, it's all made in America, and, and decided that the only way this brand will ever be successful and return money to its shareholders is to go discount. Go make a deal with TJ Maxx, make a deal with Walmart, make a deal with someone, and take this prestigious, tiny brand and discount it. And, I, and that's the only way out. Now, we're looking at it, and we'll see. Where does it go from here? Uh, I, I don't think it's going to be the way it's been before. And if anyone thinks that, in my personal opinion, they're going to wait a very long time. Okay, final question from anyone we open it up. Uh, real estate. What happens to all of these shopping malls? Well, I, I've asked my real estate friends, and there's one or two here, uh, who, you know, and, and I said to Steve that, um, that I don't think it's a matter of uh, filling stores and shopping space, because you're going to have pickup and delivery. First of all, the, the traffic in cities around, I, you know, uh, Outdoor Voice is based in Austin, so I go there once a month. I sometimes think I'm in New York or LA in Austin. I can't believe it. This was a small city, whatever. So I don't think people are running to pick up their stuff at stores anymore. Plus, you'll just call 1-800-DELIVER at this minute, and you get the delivery anyway. So um, I don't know what's going to happen. I, I think if, if you look at, if you connect all the dots and look at the empty stores in this city, it's going to get worse and worse. The mall people here, a few of them are here, will have to answer that question. Everyone's asking for lower rents, and uh, they're not getting them as easily as they like to. We're all closing stores. And uh, people aren't lowering their prices yet on, on real estate. Uh, it's sad for the cities because the fact is that you have three empty stores on a block with 10 stores, and it's for three or four blocks running. It takes a little away. Look at Bleecker Street, the hottest street in the world. But retailers are emotional. They always overreact. And right now, we're in a period. I don't know if they're underreacting right now. I don't know what's going to happen. Thank you, Mickey. Let's, uh, let's open it up for questions. I'm sure uh, that there's a lot of people who want to uh, Want to, want to ask a question uh, this afternoon of Mickey Drexler. Sorry, wait, Lee, it's harder to see at this hour, interestingly. Go ahead, sir. Thank you. Um, it seems that most of the exciting things that are happening in retail right now are at the intersection of fashion and technology. And I don't know if it's, you know, certainly Farfetch is doing interesting things with their concept stores, 
Neiman Marcus is tied up with Rent the Runway, as you discussed. You are a visionary. You've done amazing things. What is your best guess for the retail of the future, like the retail store that could exist in 10 or 20 years? Well, um, you know, I can use all the cliche terms that are out there. Expe but, and I suggest, by if you want to see a phenomenally successful business, go to uh, Glossier's showroom. Anyone been there? I don't know if anyone's heard of Glossier. And they opened the store on Broadway uh, last Sunday. I don't know if anyone's seen it. Uh, it's, to me, the epitome of an experience. It's a fragrance store, one fragrance. Uh, I think you've got to have the right product. You've got to have the great imagination. You've got to give someone a feeling about wanting to shop there and be there. Uh, or else you've got to give them the greatest value in the world. I think the technology, we're all using the technology. It's just a matter of having... Uh, being loaded down with all this real estate where you're paying high rents and every year your, your EBITDA is going this way because in, in store by store EBITDA. Uh, but I think it's still going to be, it, maybe I'm old fashioned, but I still think it's going to be the product, the offering, and being in a business that's just not out there the same way anymore. But do you need another fragrance in America? No, but if you do it the right cool way, do you need another sneaker? Except all birds did a comfortable sneaker and they kind of made it cool, or the customers made it cool to wear whatever you think it looks like. I don't know how many people here are wearing Allbirds today, but you know, it's kind of, they say, a geek sneak or whatever that means. It went from zero to 80 million in about 10 minutes. But that's what I think is going to happen, and it just still starts with a great idea and great product. Ma'am. Thank you. Hi, Mickey, um, I worked with you at The Gap in the early 90s. Oh? Yes. What, I, you who are you? I, I was a peon. My What's name your name? Is Jill Feldman. Sh and it was the mo one of the most exciting times in my career. And you taught me attention to detail, and I never forgot it. Um, but my question is, how important do you think celebrity is in fashion today? Well, again, I am not an expert, but look at Kim Kardashian. My point the Gigi Hadid sisters, millions of people. I think it's really important. Great American Jeans, by which Kardashian sister did it. The great I, American they Jeans. The same to me. Yeah, they're all do it. Yeah, they all, I agree. K, 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 one of them did it. Um, I, I think the type of celebrity is important, but I think just hiring a celebrity head, paying him or her X amount of dollars and doing the normal thing doesn't work. Social media, huge. That's why the magazines are this thin right now. Huge social media presence. Uh, and you know, even in the little company that I'm involved with, uh, Tyler, the founder, is very involved in social media. She's there. Uh, we did a Glossier event, and they were all kind of naked-ish uh, on the uh, social media thing. I called, up the next, I called her up the next morning. I said, Tyler, you're the CEO. You're the founder. Why are you naked-ish? She goes, I didn't want to tell you. So now you see it, and now it ran, and everyone loved it. I looked at it, and it's, but the world is changing rapidly, so rapidly, and, but it, it depends on the selection. If you can get those two or three to talk about you, free or not free, I think it's huge. Me too, I have a 12-year-old, so. Yeah, well, you know Very better huge. than I do. Nice to see you, Jill. Where'd you work there? I started in Boston um, as a district manager, and then I came out to San Francisco I think in 91, 92, okay. well. and worked with Ken Pilot. Oh, cool. Yeah. Right. We're going to let them get coffee. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Mickey Drexler, thank you very, very much for the conversation. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Appreciate really it. appreciate it. Thank you. That was great.